Oh, Daniel, we're alive. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Good. I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, you you sounded like choking before. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I was, totally was not choking on Dr. Pepper, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made it just in time. So, welcome everybody. This is Threat Researchers Live. This is episode 10, April 29th. And joining me, Daniel. I'm Pascal, by the way. Um, so, we have a, a pretty big presentation for you all again, as, as every month. Um, when it comes to the, to the last week of the month, I always come up and think, hey, what are we going to talk about? And do we have actually topics? And then, then you start to discuss content and then you come up with much or too much information. So what we have for you th today is we're going to talk about the Emotet cleanup and what it means uh, for most organizations. Uh, we also, Daniel's going to talk about Flubot with a capital B, uh, tried to change it everywhere I could, but I forgot this slide apparently. Um, Post secure RCE, so there has been a couple of malwares being identified by, by Mandiant. Uh, slow pills, hard pills, light pills, radial pills, and they have many more other pulses, but they all come together in like the same exploits that were discovered. Um, and apparently they, they are pointing towards a nation state that was exploiting those. Um, and I believe that the authorities also published an alert on that. Daniel, do you remember? I don't recall if they did. But I think so. Uh, and then we will have, oh, I need to, <laughs> ransomware TTPs. So behind my head is ransomware. Ransomware TDPs. Uh, so Daniel's going to show some interesting slides on on the PR websites from the dark web, um, and some some interesting news that that might follow up. Um, yeah, we have the the old famous Rick Astley with us. <laughs> um, you know the rules. Yeah. <laughs> so and there's a small topic like called Rick rolled. Um, somebody who wanted to troll around and make some fun. Um, which evidently uh, almost got me, uh, and, uh, but we will come to that later on. And then there's uh, behind Daniel's head, we have Moser Pause and Code Cough, two supply chain attacks. Um, so again, supply chain uh, seems to be happening more often, um, or at least more often in the news. Um, as a tactic, yeah, it's not surprising that people try to get uh, or try to hack through supply chain attacks because they're very efficient. You can reach a very large number of people if you hack into the right company and you can you can get your software to be distributed by their dis software distribution platform or update platforms, which is exactly what happened to um, in the Moser Pass and, and also in the Code Cough situation. So without further ado, let's start with, with the Emotet cleanup and I think you all remember, we already talked about this. Uh, I don't know if it was the previous or in the January episode that we talked about the, the Emotet takedown, um, where the authorities took down many or a portion of the servers, uh, the command and control servers from Emotet. And when that happened, there was a researcher who found that there, even after takedown and, and after owning the, the C2 servers, so it's actually not takedown, they, they owned the servers because they used them to track who was still infected. And, and I can say there, there were some people who were infected with Emotet who, who got pretty quickly blacklisted uh, on, and, and also listed on spam list because they had an Emotet infection. So that was their way of, of feeding back information to, to those that were still infected. Uh, but uh, at some point, there was a researcher who observed that there was a new payload being downloaded and distributed from those those machines. And when he reversed the code, uh, to his surprise, he saw it was a kill switch. So it was an update that had several functions exported, but all the f functions did the same thing, meaning deleting the service and just removing the whole malware. So on the day after, actually, it was confirmed by the U.S. Department of Justice in a press release that the FBI and also the German police were orchestrating a removal of the remnants of, of the Imotet malware on infected hosts. So that was actually a coordinated um, attempt to, to get the malware removed, completely removed from all the hosts and from all the people that were infected. So effectively, uh, a cleanup. Um, 
malware or an update for cleanup. And that cleanup was scheduled for April 25th. And April 25th, that was this weekend. So this weekend, uh, a lot of machines had their Emotet completely removed, which is a good thing. However, what, what does it mean for organizations? And you have to know that, that Emotet evolved from a banking Trojan. So originally it was a malware banking Trojan, but it, it quickly evolved into a dropper. As the criminals behind Emotet found out that they could use their, their big botnet as a malware as a service platform and just rent it out or sell, sell out spots to other criminals to use it to download their malware. So actually it became like a dropper. And things they dropped, um, the famous TrickBot banking Trojan, Ryuk ransomware is another one that got dropped. So that means that even if we have it now cleaned up, even if the dropper is removed, it does not mean that your system is completely clean. Now, the biggest impact that authorities make was actually taking down those C2 servers. Of course, they made a big impact on, on Emotet and their distribution platform. But the cleanup by itself is, is, is not enough. If, if you were infected by Emotet, it's important that you go audit your systems, that you look if there's no other remote access tools, so rats or Trojans that are left behind, or maybe you were compromised and you have other accounts that, uh, that the, the malicious actors have set up that they're using to access your organization now. So the cleanup is a great thing, but it's not, uh, we, we should not feel safer by it. It's just, yeah, I would say it's cleaner, but safer, no. So right now, those are gone, but before they were already zombies. So the, as far as I know, there was no extra measures in Emotet uh, when they lose their command and control infrastructure to reconnect or to, to own them back into another infrastructure like some... Uh, some other botnets like VPN filter had that, where they had this, this secret knock where somebody could send a ping with a special sequence in it to redirect it to a new command and control infrastructure. This was not here as far as I know. So those were just zombies sitting out there and without their servers, yeah, they, they had no commands and, and nobody who was able to instruct them to download anything. But anyway, they're now removed. Just be aware that removing that will not remove any other malware or uh, remote access tool or any other collateral move, uh, not collateral, but lateral movement that the actors made will not be removed from, from your system. So you still have to be vigilant about what's happening if you were infected. Yeah, unfortunately in that situation, it's kind of a, a tough thing there. You know, as you said, you, you can remove the, the malware payload there, but did you get the dropper? Um, and you could remove it easily and have another one come dropping down. Uh, but yeah, over to Flubot, this one's going to be interesting. Um, Flubot is kind of similar uh, to Motet and Trickbot in the sense that it's a, it's a Trojan. Um, it just hasn't evolved into a dropper. Uh, Motet and Trickbot were both thinking Trojans to begin with, but they had evolved into droppers where they're dropping, as you said, Ryuk and other uh, ransomware payloads. But Flubot was a, a recent discovery. Um, it's a mobile banking Trojan. So what it means is it's basically dropping a malicious payload onto your phone in order to gather sensitive information, such as login credentials. Um, a Spanish company, or, no, I believe this was a Swedish company. I'm sorry, I forget where the company's located, but the company is called ProDraft. Uh, they estimate there's close to 60,000 infected devices just a few weeks ago. Um, majority of them were in Spain because that's where the campaign, uh, Flubot campaign was most notably at. Um, and it, it is distributing via a smishing program. So smishing um, is somewhat like phishing. Uh, phishing is... You know, sending malicious emails. So this is sending malicious text messages. Um, so what's happening is it's being sent through a package delivery scheme. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. But basically these text messages are designed to lure in their victims into clicking these links. And once they click these links, it's then gonna download a malicious APK file. Um, once this APK file runs on an Android phone, not iPhone, but Android phone, um, it's able to monitor uh, notifications, read, write, SMS. Uh, it can harvest your uh, contact list and it also shares that with C2 so it can continue propagating out to other uh, cell phone numbers. Um, and it also can harvest credentials via an overlay attack. So that's something similar to what MOTET and TrickBot were doing for as far as um, overlaying a website on top of your legitimate target. So when the victim uh, enters in their personal information, it actually uh, siphons that information off and sends it back to the C2 as well. Um, and another notable thing about the Flubot is it leveraged DGA. 
Um, this is a very popular technique that's even coming up in the IoT botnet world, and we're probably going to see more of that. Um, yeah, and but a little bit more. As the authorities are taking down C2 servers, I think that more of them will, will be using BGAs as well, because that's one of the methods to make a more robust infrastructure, right? Now, yeah, exactly. It helped. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I just wanted to say that on, on the, the estimation of 60,000 infected devices, actually, it, very recently, there was a report that there were spreading across 100,000 now and, and moving away because originally it started in Spain, but now it's starting to spread out across Europe. Uh, so, right. Even yeah, after so taking them down, is... yeah, even after the takedown, I believe they were still spreading. Yeah, well, it started spreading right after the takedown. So uh, on March 2nd, there was four people that were arrested in Barcelona, Spain. Um, mm. They're allegedly operators, um, people that were behind this campaign. Um, so effectively, on March 5th, the C2s were going offline. Um, you can see on the chart over there. Oh, oh, wait, I guess we're not at that slide yet. <laughs> Let me bring that Sorry, slide over there. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, with the takedown, there's four people arrested in Barcelona, as you can see with the chart below, provided by a CSIS tech blog. Um, uh, the C2 servers began to noticeably drop mm -hmm. around March 5th when the actual takedown began. Um, but because the malware program is malware as a service, like we were talking about with Motet and TrickBot, people rent out Flubot in order to distribute their campaign. Um, and since there's operators that were still out there that still had Flubot for rent, um, it really didn't do much good to take down these four people because it continued running. And this is pretty much the same thing that we were seeing with uh, TrickBot. Now, um, to get into what package delivery scams are, um, I have a couple examples here. Um, and these are uh, real examples that I gathered from uh, myself and a friend uh, here in the United States. Um, I didn't do research into these actual links to see if it was Flubot related, but as Pascal was mentioning, after the takedown, Flubot completely blew up and started traveling, uh, was distributing through uh, UK, was it Poland, Germany, uh, Japan, and they, they speculated it was only a matter of time before it jumped to the United States, but we do have package delivery schemes here in the United States. Um, and it's coming through smishing. As I said, it's a form of phishing. It's deceptive text messages versus emails, and they contain malicious links, as you can see over here. I've censored them out, um, but they're going to send you this, this nice little text message that basically says you missed a package or a package is going to be delivered to you, um, and it has a malicious link. Uh, a link is obviously not owned by USPS or Amazon or anybody like this. It's clearly uh, a malicious link, and if you click on it, um, basically what it's going to do is it's going to deliver... Um, a, a malicious link or it's going to deliver a malicious attachment. So smishing lures is uh, luring someone into clicking on something. So basically what you're seeing here with the shipping, um, you know, we all get packages every day, especially being in quarantine. Uh, I think a lot of us are now ordering things online, you having shipped to us. So it's not so uncommon to have a package come to you or have a package missed. So this is relying on the social engineering side that someone actually might have a package or want to see if they missed a package and they'll click on it. Um, Leading to the complete compromise of a mobile device, and you know the problem with this is going to allow them to uh, look at your messages, look at your notifications, uh, and send notifications, and send messages. It's going to allow them to call people and harvest other information off your phone, which is a really, really bad thing. Um, one of the interesting things about Flubot is it's just stri strictly related to mobile Android platform. Um, and it is, it's only a baking trojan at the moment, but if it becomes something like a dropper, like TripBot and um, Emotet are, it becomes a bigger problem, especially if you're looking into like mobile ransomware, mobile bots, since IoT will use the launch of DDoS attacks. Um, and with that, we'll kind of move over into ransomware. Um, ransomware in general is a type of malware that restricts access to your computer. So um, what happens is when you become infected, it's going to lock up and encrypt all your devices. And... Uh, if you don't make a payment, basically you lose it. If you don't have backups, you lose all your information. Uh, but it spreads in a couple different ways. Uh, most notably, it spreads through mouse spam. Uh, like I was saying before with the, the phishing examples, it's going to be a lure uh, email that's going to entice you into clicking a link or opening an attachment like an Excel or a Word file. Um, from there, once you open up that file, then macros will run and you'll actually become infected with a uh, a dropper. There's also exploit kits that you can uh, become infected with ransomware. Um, exploit misconfigurations, this is something that kind of started coming around over the last few years, uh, where they're looking at RDP and other services that they can 
uh, exploit or they can brute force and get access and then they will do what is considered post exploitation. So they'll come into your system. Not only will they encrypt your information, but they'll also um, exfiltrate it out. Um, so some typical TTPs, this is normally how a ransomware campaign works. Um, they're going to want to gain initial access to your device. So that's normally through a mouse spam campaign, um, exploit misconfiguration or exploit kit, right? Um, and then they're going to look for persistence. They're going to want to look for a way to maintain a hold into that network. And they're going to look to escalate their privileges. And in that process, they're going to be looking for credential access so that they can actually move across the network. We saw a lot of that with WannaCry and its ability to warm across the network once it infected one device and when it infected the other devices on the same network. And then they're going to look to exfiltrate that. Uh, and over here on the right is an example of the uh, WannaCry attack. And, and this was the traditional ransomware attack, right? So what would happen is your computer would become infected and they would have a pop-up that says, hey, give me like 300 dollars in Bitcoin and everything's going to be fine. Well, now we've kind of moved into a new world of double extortion, as a lot of people like to say. Um, they are moving in and they're, exfiltr they're exfiltrating, uh, exfiltrating data uh, and they're going to use that to extort you. And so the first example over here is Babu. I think we all know about this group. They've been in the news quite often uh, in the last few days. They targeted and hit the Metropolitan Police Department in DC uh, and they have a bunch of their information. So one of the things that they're doing as far as the that was recently, not right? Already, that that, yes, that is very like recent. Last, this was yeah, in the last couple of days, right? I'd say like the last 48 hours. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I, so for the people, I'll listening, even don't, as, don't feel bad if you didn't know. <laughs> it's just <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll even go as far as give the people a little bit more information. Uh, I just checked on their website this morning and they've actually taken down the Metropolitan Police Department information. So uh, it seems like they're probably in the midst of negotiating uh, or some some reason why they've taken yeah, it down. That is, anyways, on the next slide. That is one way to get people back to the negotiation table, right? Yeah, and that's what I'm going to get into here with the, the double extortion of getting people back to negotiation tables. You know, many times with the, like the WannaCry lockup with your own single computers, if you had backups, you'd just let them destroy your hard drive and you just restart yeah, from yeah. scratch with your backups. Just, yeah, it, uh, it, it, it was yeah. not always just. If, if, if you look at many of the examples, people who, who lost many, uh, how much millions of, of, of dollars of damage it did uh, back in the time. Uh, but, but now people know better. So, so I would guess that most people are better prepared in having backups uh, to, to restore more quickly their systems. So. But the, the, that's the reason why double extortion has come in is because mm -hmm. even if you can back up your network, you still have to deal with the leak and the risk and possibility. And that's what the Metropolitan yeah. Police was dealing with as far as this group was threatening to expose informants, expose cases of corruption and all kinds of other uh, issues with the police department. And so, you know, even if the police department had backups and even if they were to say, you know, forget you guys, we're not paying you, you know, destroy it, we'll go from backup. Well, that data can still be leaked. So there's another reason why uh, the police department might be incentivized to pay a ransom, uh, which we always advise never to pay a ransom. Um, but, you know, this, this is a very interesting tactic and it, it's not just seen by this one group. There's also um, re-evil, uh, if we go yeah. one more slide so forward. so so that that is what we see here on 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 this slide right so that that is the website of babook right it's on the dark web mm -hmm. and it's like uh, their website where they where they post all the files that were leaked and they they give some samples to demonstrate that the leak is real right because i I'm, yes sir there's about yeah go ahead i was gonna say there's about a dozen ransomware groups out there with pr sites and that's pretty much how they operate is that they will hit a target and then they will say that they hit a target and they'll begin posting up sensitive information to prove that they've actually been that target's network and that the ransom is legitimate. And so, as you said, this is an image from the Bob Luke website. Um, these are screenshots of uh, information from the police department network that they're saying, yeah. hey, this is what we have and this is what we'll expose even more. Yeah, there, there, there were actual images where you had uh, some, some of the case files where the names of the... Yeah, uh, case files, the arrest, photos. Yeah, Fo photos in yeah, there, full names, what they did, what they did wrong. That is even leaked. So, yeah, and I, yeah. I would say that, yeah, it's 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 not only to to point the victim to it, but I I believe that the media is also keeping an eye on those things. So whenever a company is popping up in those websites, it's only a matter of time before the whole case comes in the media and everybody knows that your company has been a victim of, of ransomware, 
right? So that. Well, that's a actually that's a really good uh, example there. So if you go back one slide there, uh, we can show the viewers exactly like how many people. It's it's thousands of people. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, thousands of people that are actually have access to this website are going and looking at it. And then um, if you actually skip two slides forward to the slide that we're supposed to be on, it's an example yeah. of like how the media uh, can can actually cause more issues. And, and as I said, this is another example of double extortion that uh, re-evil targeted Qantas, a company that Apple uses. Um, and because of that, they, they got a lot of information pertaining to Apple. I think it's like a $50 million ransom. But 9to5Mac, a uh, journalist outlet, decided to go through the leaked, inf leaked information uh, and then write an article about what devices were coming out through Apple, which, you know, a lot of people have an opinion on this saying that you just reward and incentivize the criminals yeah. by publishing this kind of information. But at the same time, this shows why double extortion is so um, important because Qantas, the company that was originally impacted, um, could pay the ransom and everything be fine. But this information is still out there. So there, there's more of a reason for Apple to actually pay the extortion because they don't want their intellectual property disclosed, which causes a really big issue here. Uh, it's 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 pretty genius what these authors have done as far as this double extortion technique of ensuring a payment and bringing people back to the table. But even to go even a little step further with the next uh, group here, Avedon, uh, Avedon has another uh, what we call a, a triple extortion. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only will they encrypt your information, they will steal your information and they will publish their information. But if you don't respond to them, you don't talk to them, they will launch a DDoS attack against your services until you come back and speak to them, which is a very, very interesting concept of getting someone's attention and making them pay. I mean, you're already dealing with your network encrypted and all your devices. Now you have an actual outage and an issue of service availability. This is really going to drive the victim into going back into negotiation tables with them. It presents a very large problem for our industry of how to deal with this going forward. So it's like, yeah. So they their tactics are, first of all, they encrypt your data. If you don't care about your data because you have backups, well, before encrypting, they will make sure that they exfiltrate something, which which fits well into the lateral movement and the escalation of privileges. Because yeah, they need something interesting to to exfiltrate. If they if they hit a laptop of a person that has no interesting information, well, they will not be able to extract any anything that's of value. However, if they can move across the network, get to the right server, get access to those files that are secret or that are our intellectual property or very sensitive well then they can upload them and once they upload they put it on the website if still no reaction because nobody cares about what has been stolen well yeah then they make noise like little babies instead of starting to cry they will do a ddos attack and try to get you back to the table so yeah these these are very hard to stop um it's just really interesting showing the the evolution of you know, targeting individual PCs and asking for $300 to targeting Fortune 500 companies and looking yeah. for intellectual property that you can, you know, raise. I mean, we went from asking, you know, was it $300 in Bitcoin to like $50 million in ransom? It's, oh. it's an incredible jump in just a few years. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 interesting how they combine multiple techniques because DDoS was a separate technique that existed on its own, and then you had yeah. encryption. That was it. That was the original ransom where technique that existed on its own and then you have the data breaches and data leaks which was also a separate tactic and now they combined the three of them into yeah to, to what we would also call super malware because yeah what, what can you do against that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, i mean it's, it's very it's, hard to fight there's what well, once the information is gone it's gone you yeah you can try to take them down or try to find them quickly enough to to take down the information but Besides that, there's not much you can do. Yeah, it, it's very interesting seeing ransomware uh, bringing DDoS into the mix. I mean, traditionally, we see DDoS with ransom extortion as far as RDoS goes, um, where they launch a DDoS attack against your network and they ask for Bitcoin to stop that attack. But to see them launching a DDoS, asking them to pay an extortion from a ransomware attack, that's just amazing watching them connect and piggyback all these things together. Yeah, it, it, it confirms that there's an underground economy that's that's growing, that people can easily get access to the right services uh, w without too much trouble. Oh, yeah. 
because doing a DDoS attack is a separate area of kind of attacks compared to writing malware for Windows, right? So you need to, to, to create yeah. a botnet, but mostly IoT devices, it's totally different. So, but they, they can just rent the services so, so easily. And that's, that's what makes up the whole problem. This whole economy is starting to, to mesh together and to, to leverage each other's services to, and they become much more dangerous that way. Now, I don't know if we have the, the other slide for dark side, but that's another ransomware group that was, uh, yeah, I don't think we have uh, it. No, um, it, it did not make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it, the group was doing also another interesting form of a uh, double extortion where if they were not getting the response that they wanted from the group, um, they were alleging, uh, threatening that they were going to disclose information to their insider traders to help devalue the stock of the company. Um, there's been, I think, one other person that's tried to do this whole disclosure for profit and shorting stocks. Uh, but this is a very interesting technique to see them trying to pick up with the whole popularity of, of stock markets and, and trading and all this that they're yeah. going to try and start shorting. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah, so, so it's unfortunate. What, yeah, one, one of the important assets of a company is its reputation, of course. So whatever can impact the reputation. And that's why those leaks, those leaks are damaging the reputation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the one weird thing is that, you know, I saw the argument about the whole, um, you know, market manipulation stock thing is that like a lot of companies that get hit um, somehow do better in the stock market two or three years down the line. So while it might be a short term gain for them, um, it might not be such a realistic impact for the company. It's more like you said, the reputation, um, uh, what people think, you know, the stock will go up and down. But the people's opinion is a very, very important subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it also depends on how they handle. So, be, being hacked is not a crime, or, or yeah, of course not, not a crime. But uh, <laughs> get getting hacked is 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 not where it stops. Where, where actually, for me, the most important is how a company handles that hack, how it communicates, how it makes sure that it will never happen again. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're always it's it's so, it's so hard our infrastructure is getting so complex um people are, are moving to the cloud people are running private clouds public clouds and enterprise on-prem try to keep control of everything that's happening and then you have the devops the guys who publish the applications and they set up some some other clouds and everything is so dynamic so you need to keep control on all of this make sure that there's not too much permissions make sure that there's no files running around or being copied by a partner that that might be published on another website without permissions it's all becoming so complex because our infrastructure is that complex so it's it's not that the attacks are so much more complex these days but it's just that what our IT managers and security operations is facing is such a complex infrastructure with so many things to keep it running to it's it's hard to manage and then then add to that all the events that we need to look at uh, all the false positives and and how how do we find the right information out of of that whole mess of of big big events which was also a topic that we we were considering for this uh this uh episode but that didn't make the cut either uh which is uh the you know i think that's going to be a whole entire that's going to be yeah. a whole entire episode uh, we're going to be able to talk for at least an hour on that subject alone. Um, yeah, maybe the next one. The next like episode. As you said, well, as you said, you know, it's, it seems like it's almost a losing war uh, with everything that we're going up against and how quickly everything's evolving and how quickly the criminals are evolving. Uh, these threat groups and their TTPs are just yeah. never ending and always progressing. Um, as you can see, they're learning how to chain one to another, uh, yeah. presenting even more of an issue. All right. So well, pulse, 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 pulse. With that good news, <laughs> thank you very much, Daniel. Now I feel so much better yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Just don't click on anything. Just don't click on. Anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not even opening my email anymore. I just leave it closed. <laughs> 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 Have yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, re re remember, at, at, at some point, I was talking to somebody who was uh, working in a hospital as an administrator, and the, the guy was just scared to open his email. He, he was just scared to read his enterprise email because he knew that he was an administrator. He had access to, to many stuff. He had the credentials. 
So whenever he opens an email, that could be a trigger that started a movement or installed something that could move across the network and start encrypting. So those people actually had to move to separate machines to read their email. And yeah, <laughs> can you imagine that you need one machine to read your email and then another machine to do the actual work? That's where the screenshot with the mobile phone come from. You know, you make the, you make the screenshot and you email to your other account. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Back to basics. Great way to, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OPSEC one on one. Yeah, screenshot everything. So and 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 here's another story. Um, slow pulls, slide pulls, hard pulls. There, there's a lot of pulls in there. Quiet pulls, radial pulls, ten blood, atrium, all related. Pacemaker, pulse check, pulse jump. I think Mandiant had had a really. A really creative moment there by, by finding all those names. These are actually all tools that were used together in, in campaigns, several campaigns that, that they saw at the same time. They were not all related. They're not sure that everything is related, but uh, Mandiant fo found them while investigating multiple intrusions in, in defense, government, and also in financial in organizations. But the one thing in common is that they were all related with an exploit or the exploitation of post secure VPN devices. You know, the SSL VPN, a very popular product uh, to, to do remote access. And with remote working nowadays, yeah, more and more people are using remote and, and relying on remote access. And post secure VPN is one of the market leaders in that area to, to provide convenient access without having to install a, a full client and also with all the features of security on the client and being checked before the connection is, is established. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they found that malicious actors were, were actually able to bypass single and multi-factor authentication on those devices. So we always say whenever you deploy remote access like RDP or SSL VPN, make sure that you have multi-factor authentication because there's cred credential stuffing going on. Many people are stealing credentials and trying those or, or permutations of those credentials to get access. But... and. Then we say, okay, add multi-factor, and that solves that problem. However, if if there's if there's a way to bypass multi-factor authentication, well, then pretty much all is gone, all security is gone. So, so they found those actors being able to bypass multi-factor authentication also persist across upgrades. So, whenever they did an upgrade or or or, or something on on the device, they were still keeping their access, and they maintained access through web shells. So. Post secure VPN, it's an SSL VPN. That means that when you go to the device, you can have a web page. So it has like a web server with, with, uh, with, with web files in there and functionality like a website. So, so they installed web, uh, web shells uh, to do remote exploitation and to keep access to, to the website and to, when, whenever something changes, reconfigure the device to give themselves access again. So, and some of those intrusions were exploitation of previously disclosed post secure vulnerabilities and and those have been been heavily uh published by the fbi and by by the CISA. um also we did reports on 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 them so that was 2019 2020 so the start of the pandemic uh, and just before the start of the whole pandemic uh already v vpn services were being attacked and had multiple of their vulnerabilities being exploited actively by uh, by nation states and by many other malicious actors. And that went on into 2020, but then that got fixed, or at least we thought that most of the problem got fixed. But now they found, so Manjin found that one of the intrusions was also due to an exploitation of a previously unknown vulnerability. So a zero day, basically. And when Pulse Secure investigated, they find indeed that there was a new vulnerability. So that's the CVE, CVE right here. It's it has a score of ten because yeah, it's it provides remote remote access with without even so without any authentication, you can execute anything on the machine. Um, so and that was discovered in in April, but it was already being abused before. So it's not the first time that we see a zero day like that being abused, uh, even before it's being fixed. Um, we have had more of these lately, uh, much more compared to other years, I would say. Um, so and they they found several files and tools installed, like slow pull. One of them they called slow pulls, and slow pulls is 
coming in different variants. It provides bypass or it logs the credentials. When somebody logs into the system, it would log them and upload those credentials so a malicious actor can use the same credentials to get access afterwards. But there's also bypasses in there, like, uh, yeah, you have the LDAP, so the, the Windows Active Directory integration, and LDAP radius uh, two-factor bypass, so if you have the tokens with the number ACE two-factor, um, Realm sign in two factor bypass. So, so pretty much every two factor sign in that you can have, whether you're using a key or whether you're using a certificate or you're using uh, LDAP integration for authentication, they, they pretty much had a bypass for it. And then you also had some web shells that were deployed to, to give them remote command execution. So they can just post to this specific URL on the SSL VPN and that would execute their commands on the device. And, and even yeah, that device in the backend has access to, to the network. So depending on the role that they can get on that device, they can access more or less servers. And most of those servers will be important because it's, it's servers that are exposed for remote access to get people working from home. And those people need access to, to of course, interesting uh, files. And then there was Tinblood, and uh, I, I find this name pretty well found. So this this was used to clean the evidence from the log files. So they just delete whatever evidence that was in the log file. So after compromise, you would be able to find them through getting going through the log files or searching in the log files for, for some anomalous behavior. But even there, they just clean them out uh, again. Here's the importance to centralize your events and to, to use things like syslog that immediately logs the event outside of the device because once somebody tries to come into the device, the only way to see that somebody tried to do something strange on the device is by inspecting the log file. But if you rely on the log file that's on the device, once the guy has access to the device, he will remove his traces from the log file. So the thing that you can do to go against that is just sending out whatever information goes to the log file. Also send it out to other servers. Just centralize all your logs and, and you will have automatically some kind of protection against that. Then they already need to hack into your syslog server uh, and, and mess with the files over there. So, so it becomes much more difficult to hide your traces. So, and yeah, Mandiant also did uh, did some attribution. So they, they found that the most targeted US defense companies uh, that were targeted with that slow pulse and radial pulse, that was already as early as August 20 until March 2021. So this has been going on for, for some time and overlaps with, uh, with the solar winds, overlaps with, uh, with lots of the things that we already saw the exchange server uh, at the same time. Uh, and then again, uh, they believe that that group is operating on behalf of Chinese government. So it might be a nation state actor that was doing that, um, which was already suspected like in, in beginning of 2020, when we saw all the attacks on, on, the, v, on the SSL VPN and all the other remote access appliances was also pointing towards uh, nation state. Now, if it is the Chinese government or another, I don't know. Um, there's lots of politics in there uh, included as well. Of course, not by Mandian, but I'm sure that once politics gets up, it might be that Chinese become Russian suddenly or vice versa. Um, you never know. Daniel, we can't hear you anymore. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as I say, it's a popular way to go, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Russia becomes China, China becomes Russia. Well, yeah, there are they're, they're, they're other yeah, there, there, there are other higher things involved than, than just the attack itself. Um, now, when Mandian says it, I, I'm pretty sure that it's based on technical information. That doesn't mean that it's correct. Uh, we are always very suspect and careful about the attribution, but Mandian did it based on the technical uh, information they have, and they have access to, and by linking up previous tactics and code, that looked the same which does not mean that it's always a good hit on, on, on the right attribution, because we have seen many nation states that just use the tactics of another nation state and yeah. use reuse the code to create false flags so that people would think, oh, it's them, while it's a whole other one who did it. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's, that's a problem with uh, general frameworks. We, we're kind of getting into that with the Hacker Almanac that we're drafting mm -hmm. at the moment, where 
you know, while these frameworks really help the industry um, identify groups, you know, there, there can be uh, a, an APT name that's known differently between each group. So we need standardization, but that standardization is also our weak point because it allows these criminals to go up into the framework, look at it, figure out how another group works. And as Pascal says, launch these false flag attacks where it appears to be um, one group, but it's actually another one just using their tactics, techniques, and procedures because we were so kind enough to document it for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the importance here is, is, is to know that they, they found activity as early as August 2020. So that means it's not something that happened recently. It's something that was discovered recently, but not something that has been going on recently. It has been going on for a while. And the, the other one, the hard pulse and quiet pulse that they believe is not tied to the same group, that was from October 2020. So... They were in the network for for some time or in those devices for some time of course we don't know to what extent they got access so if you have a pulse vpn make sure that you apply the patches uh, the latest updates because i would assume at this point a lot of people have pulse vpn uh considering how heavily it's been targeted over the last three years yeah well yeah <laughs> well there, there, but, uh, there's many others out there now i I know Pulse VPN very well because I worked 10 years at Juniper and that was the time that Pulse VPN was there. But uh, uh, there, there, there's many other solutions out there as well for, for remote access and SSL VPN access, sometimes integrated with the firewall. Some, but Pulse is one that is specifically for the remote access and they have a big share of the market, that is for sure. Um, yeah. And have a good uh, de deployment in governments and, and defense uh, institutions. So that makes them, of course, a, a big target. Um, and this shows, again, the zero day that's being abused. Um, that, that scares me a little bit because the company... So Pill Secure started working on, on the evidence that Mandiant gave them on the compromises because Mandiant could not figure out how did they get initial access to the device. So at that point, Pulse Secure came, came in, or they sent the information to Pulse Secure, which go look into the evidence that Mandiant provided them from their customers. And they saw, hey, that's something that we didn't know yet. There's a new vulnerability here. So Pulse themselves found the vulnerability, but using the information from an actual hack. So that means that the attackers already knew about the vulnerability and were using it even before the vendor got aware of it. Of it. So. And that is not the first time it happens, right? This year, uh, we've seen it before uh, with uh, with some attacks. So uh, that that is a bad evolution. Um, now we already knew that there are zero days out there, and that governments have they have the money to invest in people to go search for vulnerabilities. And you have to be realistic. There are some good people that are hired in those governments. The same as in the industry. If the industry can find vulnerabilities, any group, secret group can find vulnerabilities. So it's, it's threat right. hunting. So have to be realistic about Especially that. Especially well-funded. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. If if they have the money to to hire one or two threat hunters, well, they they might very well find some zero days, a couple of zero days per year. And what happens most of the time when the good guys and the good companies find them, they will publish them, uh, they will talk with the vendor, they will make them fixed. But if if a secret agency finds them, I'm not talking about a specific agency here. <laughs> I have the wrong T-shirt now. But if if a specific agency finds this. Oh, the tactic is, oh, keep it quiet. <laughs> let's uh, let's yeah, wait for the right moment to use it and abuse it, right? Yeah, or you can sell it for millions of dollars. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then there are the companies who sell it, but that that's on that that's an ethical discussion. We saw that discussion already happen uh, last year, but that's that's an ethical discussion. Can you sell it? Um, of course, there's a market for that, but if that is is legal or not, uh, I would say more yeah. illegal than legal, but like selling weapons, right? There, There is a gray zone there. It all Somewhere. depends on who you're selling it to. <laughs> yeah. Bad reality. If you're selling it to me, I, I won't come at you, right? <laughs> but you sell it to my I, biggest competitor. I don't think mm -hmm. I can. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even know if I could sell it to you as an American selling to a European, isn't mm -hmm. that? 
I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I figure that it's falling any the same like weapons trade laws. Like you can't just take an AK from Texas to Belgium. So <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know if we already have cyber laws for, for selling vulnerabilities. I, I wouldn't think so. And I don't, I don't think no. it would be good to start one. We would just say it's illegal. Let's not sell vulnerabilities. Let's fix them first. Yeah. And you can yeah, sell them after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So ju just to have you being aware, this thing exists. It's, it's not like a rarity or like a super. We we always found we we always thought about zero days when you start and see oh zero day wow and it's like no it's, it's not that wow it's just a reality. If if many people security and researchers can find it, anybody else can find it as well. It just depends who they work for those those vulnerability researchers. Yeah. Oh yeah, and 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 that was the whole Rick Astley. Yeah, <laughs> we we were gonna play that music, but we, I, I'm not sure if if YouTube will uh, will take us offline after playing that for <laughs> copyright. Um, and 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 actually talking about all those vulnerabilities and selling and governments uh, might be that we are taken down anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's either sharing hack material or playing uh, yeah. a rig roll. <laughs> okay, but uh, yeah, th this one almost got me because uh, when I came aware of the CVE 2021-22893, so the Pulse Secure Remote Command Execution vulnerability, the first thing you do is go search for POX because there's always researchers out there who would like to push their POC onto the internet. And we already did the rant last time, so we're not going to redo that. But I, I found one. We, get, we have time. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I went to search. Okay, type in the CVE POC immediately. Bang, hit. And I think, oh no, again, here we go again. And another one that publishes a POC that is completely functional. And that again. So I started typing on, on, on LinkedIn. Hey guys, there's this CVE going around. Here's the article. And by the way, there's already a POC active. And as I wrote this, Sorry, I think that. Not typing. <laughs> yeah, well, so, some second nature came back to me saying that you should verify what you're right. Yeah, because I already posted that actually. <laughs> no, nobody saw it, but it got posted and then I deleted it. <laughs> and then I got to verify. And luckily I verified because, yeah, somebody was trolling out there. Uh, and, and actually, you've been rickrolled. No, I've been rickrolled uh, <laughs> almost uh, or as good as. So when, when you go look into the code and you actually read the code and you see that the guy and uh, the guy is uh, Zephyr Fish, it's not the first time he did that. Um, but he says, this is how dangerous not reading source code is. So, but it's, it's commented out by the way. So it's not gonna remove your whole Linux system if you just run it without uh, putting in the code. And yeah, Daniel, you can applaud that effort by Zephyr Fish. Thank you. That is absolutely <laughs> true and good. And yeah, I, what, I like what, good trolls. You know? <laughs> There's not a lot of funny things in this yeah. industry anymore, so you gotta laugh when you see yeah. something funny. <laughs> yeah, and and it's for, who doesn't know the lyrics about "We're no strangers to love"? You know the rules, and so do I, right? So everybody immediately knows. Oh, that's Rick Astley. So we've you've been Rick Roll. It has been going on in our industry like forever. This this joke with uh, Rick Astley. Um, I don't know why he was picked um, because that that was actually legitimate. I was 13 years old or 14 years old at the moment. I actually I I have some nice memories on that song. Uh, so the guy <laughs> could actually perform a concert at DefCon, I think, at this point. You know, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. He will. <laughs> <laughs> he will have so many fans. I'm sure. Yeah. But he, he actually made it to YouTube. Yeah, I uh, re remember we were looking for the video and then we saw that yeah. that in February 2021, there was a lot of uh, of, of tumult about and, and uh, somebody posting a remastered version of Never Gonna Give You Up in 4K 60 frames per second. And the fans were so against it because it shouldn't be. Still, this guy is, is like forever. At that yeah. time, you wouldn't think that he would, would be such a classic, but he's a classic especially for the yeah. IT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Click Studios. Yeah, you can't read it because Daniel is obscuring it, but that's our job, obscure whatever you shouldn't be seeing. Moser Pulse. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we, we can solve that, <laughs> Don't you look like I'm slacking on the job. Technology. Lo <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Everything solved. Yeah, I, I know it's a lot of text on, 
on the slide. And and I know you don't like that, Daniel. And I agree with you yeah. with your remark that. But you want to see me, right? Yeah. I mean, everybody logs in just to look at his face. I I put too much text <laughs> because I wanted to remember what to say. Um, it's 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 not like every story is uh, so fresh out of my mind. Um, so. Yeah. Moser Pass. It's it was a smaller one. I um, I don't know if it if it hit many raiders, but um, so at uh, at some point, Click Studios and it was like it was a Swedish company. What was it called again? It's it's in the links. Uh, CSIS or something. Um, a Swedish security company that published a blog and and called out Moser Pass. Um, we have the links down below, by the way. So if you if you want to follow what we're talking about, all the resources and and all the links to the articles, um, they are down below. So if you click on in the comment, you will find the link there, uh, and you can follow Moser Pass. Um, but uh, so Click Studios is is um, apparently I, I didn't know them, but uh, they 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 are pretty big in, in enterprise management and also enterprise password management. Um, they, they have some, some big customers in, in their portfolio. And they have a software called Password State, which, which just keeps track of the enterprise password, like a password manager, but on enterprise level, and also contains all the passwords of the most important computers and servers and so on. So basically, that's like uh, uh, the crown jewels of, of the, the, the enterprise network right there. So yeah, a jackpot for sure. Yeah, a malicious actor was was able to compromise the in-place upgrade functionality. So how it works is that your software calls up on the on the, on the web server of um, of Click Click Studios. Yeah, right. Calls up on on their website and then gets redirected. Depending on the version that you're running, you need a certain upgrade archive so it will go and download that archive that archive is somewhere on a cdn so you go to click studios website that redirects the request to a cdn server where the file is downloads the files uh the the up in place upgrade procedure unpacks that file and then installs the the, the upgrade and then launches stops the processes launches in and loads in memory the new dlls that were added uh, by the upgrade now malicious actors were able to redirect so through that upgrade director website, they were able to redirect a request, not to the right version on the CDN, but to a other malicious website that they set up that Click Studio did not have in control. And they placed a file there, an upgrade service file, the same zip file name as the original files that the end place upgrade uses. But in there, there was a compromised file. So they had a compromised library that got downloaded by those who used the in-place uh, upgrade process at that moment. It got extracted. In that file, there was a modified DLL, so the same DLL name as, uh, as one of the existing DLLs, but just modified. That got loaded into memory, and that malicious DLL started downloading another zip file, which then was loaded into memory and started executing. And in-memory execution then started looking for data, like computer name, username, domain name, any information it could find on that server. Um, also password states, information of the proxy server address, the username, uh, and password used for, for password state. All that information was being siphoned off of the computer and then uploaded towards the, 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 the malicious uh, or the, the malicious actor's website. So. Luckily, the, the compromise only existed for approximately 28 hours, so they find it fairly quickly um, compared to another situation that we're going to talk to in a second. But uh, they, they, they were quick on, on the ball and they found out that it was happening. So only customers that performed upgrades, so if you're a customer of Click Studios, only if you performed an upgrade between April 20th, 8.30 at night UTC time until April 22nd, midnight, 30 minutes UTC, then you are believed to be affected by this malicious software. All manual upgrades were not compromised, but it shows again, getting access. Um, we saw that with, uh, what was it, WannaCry version 2? Um, that, that did the same thing uh, with Midoc. It's, yep. it's the same tactic. And it's a good tactic because it allows you to amplify your spreading. It's, it's like having a botnet, but only you're, you're leveraging well-known companies to spread your malware. And leveraging installer processes is very convenient because what do we all do when we install something? We double click on the executable and then it asks for what? 
escalated privileges. It asks for more privileges because it wants to install something as admin and you click yes and so they get access to the whole machine. So, and it comes at the right moment because you just pressed on the install button. So you are not concerned of getting a pop-up because you know that pop-up is a direct reaction to you clicking on the installation. If you click on an email link and you get a pop-up, hey, I want that min rights here, you say, mm -mm, something is wrong here. But um, if you do it during the install, well, you trust it. And so they're just running on, on, on trust that you have with existing vendors to propagate their malware. Yeah, talking about supply chain. So here's another one. It just a is lot of a lot of them <laughs> in this year. It's been a very popular one. Yeah, yeah, and 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 different ones. So so yeah. So so some of them were changed code in open source, where they just uh, put in some downloaders or password stealers and open source modules that get compiled into code and then deployed into the into the the, the enterprise. Others just had malicious DLLs that they put inside. Um, and this one is, is actually uh, a, a modification. So the CodeCov is a online platform that is, is hosting code testing and, and reports and statistics. And to do that, they have a module that runs in the environment of their customer that takes all that information and then uploads it. And that uploader is called a the bash uploader tool. Yeah, probably it's a script, right? Bash uploader tool must be written in bash scripting. Um, so a threat actor actually got access to that bash uploader tool and was able to modify it. The bash uploader was running in a Docker container and apparently the code or the instructions that were building that Docker container were not secured and were leaking the information or the credentials of that Docker container. So malicious actor had access to the Docker container, were able to change that bash uploader tool and just put in the code to actually upload the information. So you can see here, this is how the code has been changed. Uh, so here you have a curl command that gets information, takes the environment and uploads it to a malicious web server, to the attacker's web server. Um, now, the bad thing for me about this is that how CodeCov learned about that compromise. So it took them, uh, how long? Two months, I believe it took them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, went undetected for over two months. Um, and it was actually detected by a customer. It was a customer that was, was running this uploader, this bash uploader script. And he saw that the hash of the latest one that he downloaded did not match the hash in the Git repository from Go CodeCov. So that's where they saw that, oh, always, something... Always check your hashes. Yeah, so something's off with the tool that gets automatically downloaded and, and the source code that we have published in, in, in our Git. So it's not the same version. And then they went to look and they found out that there were some extra commands in there that are actually exfiltrating information and uploading it to a web server. So And that was going on for, for, for a good part uh, of two months. Yeah, and yeah, oh, no. Uh, this is a good one here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, speaking about code cover, coverage and review. So it's clear that from code cov, code reviews are important. And we already seen it in the past as well. Code that gets injected, like in the solar, solar rinse, was the same thing. Codes was injected in the real source code or swapped the code file during the, the DevOps pipeline. So you have that CI pipeline, the continuous integration pipeline, where you have the, the code version control, where you push your code, you commit your code, and then it automatically gets compiled, gets built, gets packaged. A container is being made and then is pushed out to production for de deployment or it's pushed out to the download server for, for downloading. That's the whole CI CD pipeline as we know it. So the whole DevOps uh, in, in the more popular word as we call it. Now we see hackers more shifting left in the pipeline, which means coming closer to that source code. So that's what we see in the solar winds attack uh, where they, they actually had malware. They had malware malware in running on the machine and that malware swapped out one of the code files every time the build was happening, which was pretty clever because even if you do code review, you're reviewing the real code. So it's only when you click the build button, then the malware sees that there's a build process starting. Then he swaps out the original file with the infected file and that gets compiled into the whole build of SolarWinds module and then gets deployed. And then 
when the build is done, it swaps back the original one. So when you go back for code review, you don't even see it. So it was a pretty clever one. Um, now, code coverage is still very important and reviews as well. Um, so in talking about code reviews, a group of the University of Minnesota researchers were doing an experiment. So, so what they thought was, let's see how much open source is actually inspecting code and, and looking at the code before clicking that commit button or allowing a commit into, into the main tree. Um, so what they did is they deliberately introduced some, some memory leaks and some, or better, some, some freeze um, that, 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 that were not done while they can leave like a vulnerability in memory where you can siphon off data. Uh, and they submitted that as changes to the official Linux code base. I don't know if it was ever committed. I, I don't think so, but they submitted it. And then they sent an email to say, hey, be careful. Uh, don't commit this patch that we submitted to you. That was, uh, that's a patch that contains a vulnerability. It was just part of our research. Um, and, and how did they call that again? The um, a hypocrite, yeah, <laughs> a hy hypocrite commits. That that's the whole name that is going around. So now there's a lot of controversy out there because yeah, Linux. It's it's all people who do this in their free time. Um, it's like wasting their time if they submit something like that and then don't don't waste our time. At the same time, they they have a point as well because. It, it it is one way that you can get into that code repository and and you might say yeah but they use the university of minnesota's account which is a trusted account well hell i can break well no i cannot break into Just their service but account so, doesn't mean it should yeah, be so audited you know somebody can abuse that account somebody can get access to that account or send an email from that account or send a commit from that account so it's 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 very dangerous to to allow it um does that you know, mean that my grandma would say it really depends on whose ox is getting bored in the situation, right? And yeah, so it's it, it's who looks bad, who looks shameful. But you know, my my opinion on this whole thing is that you know, the nation state through serious threat actor, you're not going to be able to write them an email saying, "Hey, please don't do that again. You're banned." Yeah. You know, they're just going to find another way to submit that code. So. Uh, yeah, it's so a tough one. Yeah, yeah. It's it, uh, I also do understand uh, this uh, uh, Greg who who's the is the master for or, or the main submitter or the owner of the code i do understand him don't don't waste this guy's time he's already busy enough and he's contributing to all of us because hey linux is running on all the operating systems so it is important that he keeps doing this job and that we we are not trying to make a joke out of him because that's a little bit what it comes down to right but at the same time right it's it's good to make them aware of that um, because maybe some people were not aware of the fact that this could happen. So so this might help them put in place some some measures that it doesn't have. And actually, companies have been doing that forever. You have the red team, blue team, right? So the red team is is trying to find holes in the security of of the organization, and they do that without an agreement or without planning or without telling what they're going to do. It's not like uh, they, so they just do it and nobody has ever reacted on the fact that a red team was able to compromise an organization. They are paid to compromise you. So if they don't, they're actually doing a bad job. Or maybe the blue team is doing a too good a job. That, that's also a possibility, but it doesn't happen that much with the blue and red team. There's always a way to get through it. So for me, it feels a lot like red teaming. So I do understand the University of Minnesota, and it was, was, was a good idea. While on the other side, I do understand the people behind the open source project. They, they don't want to be... Because if this happens from one guy, I can already see it's... It's like it's like with the scanning. We we have that gray hat scanning, and we always say, okay, so there there's a new vulnerability. Somebody is using memcached for attacks, and all of a sudden you see all the white hat scanners like boom, we're gonna scan for memcached vulnerabilities, and the whole internet gets gets almost slammed over because everybody's scanning. Now, that's a little bit yeah. the same. So it's like. One guy does it, and then all of a sudden you will have lots of white hats out there that feel like, oh, I should test the open source of that project that I'm using. Okay, let me try to do a commit of vulnerable code. Can you imagine if everybody starts doing that? Then the community, all they have to do is just read through all the commits and just read out all the bad commits. It's, it just doesn't make sense anymore. 
So, yeah. but some some sort of vigilance is important um, because we we have seen many way, and and we we actually wrote blogs about the fact that this is also a supply chain attack. Somebody who makes a malicious code. Uh, there, there, there was a story of the guy who took over a project. He was, well, one guy was tired of running that project. Another guy took it over. He was a malicious one, and he put some some backdoor code in there that siphoned off all the SSH passwords from from everybody who was using that module. Yeah, th those things are really happening. Those are supply chain attacks. So it's important to 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 keep control of the the open source, or otherwise we will have to close the source again and and make it a closed sourced effort with uh, with the community. But that that will have other problems. So. Slippery slope, and I think this uh, experiment from the University of Minnesota has definitely highlighted it, a problem uh, that we'll have to address in the future. Yeah, I I think it opens up a dialogue, and if if both parties are are reasonable, yeah. uh, they they can find a good dialogue there. And I think that we we should just shout out to everyone: don't don't start copying them, don't start doing your own research yeah, and try to don't. find. So somebody did it now. They made the news. There's lots of noise about it. Everybody knows it. So let's work on 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 fixing that, and let's not make more noise than than is necessary. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Do good people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also the more noise you make, the easier it is to hide inside that noise. So <laughs> if if you have those bad commits coming in, the bad guys can also do those commits and yeah. yeah. Give them some ideas. So that brings us to the end. Yeah. Pretty Great. good show today. Yeah, so yeah, we were pretty much on, on time now. So one hour and six minutes for very yeah. fairly well. Well done. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for your topics and your contributions. People who are interested in previous episodes, um, we, yeah, this is the 10th episode, so there's nine previous ones, logically. Uh, you can find them. We have the links down below also. So just click on those links, uh, follow them. There, there's some, some interesting topics um, that we discuss in, in previous versions. For those who want the resources, they're up here, but they're also all the links that you see here are down in the description so you can access them you can see all the resources and, and everything that we talked about and see that it's true <laughs> you can verify our work yeah. uh, we are not trolling here we're not rickrolling you um, so with that daniel thank you very much uh, the audience thank you thank for having you me pascal for sure and i think i will have you next week, next month again i will have to think about it but yes <laughs> maybe maybe there's a seat for you <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody if you have any feedback don't hesitate send us in the chat um yeah i did not look at the chat but typically there's not a lot of uh of people who, who submit their questions in the chat um don't hesitate to contact us through twitter linkedin uh email if you have questions if you have specific topics that you want us to to handle during the show we're happy to do that with that, thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye-bye.